So we have two speakers today. Uh, our speakers include the founder of Broadway in Chicago. Broadway in Chicago is a joint theatrical venture formed 16 years ago, which encompasses the five premier theater stages in the city. Broadway in Chicago has brought in an, um, an economic impact of roughly $800 million annually to the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois and supports more than 9,000 jobs. And here's how smart he is. He has his wife, Jill, here. Jill, where are you? Where are you, Jill? There we go. Give her a round of applause. His daughter, Ali, a daughter, Ali. There we go. And his son, Josh. Give him a round of applause. Lou Raisin, come on up. Lou, come on up. The next speaker is Sir Lawrence Geller. He is an accomplished businessman and entrepreneur who has led multinational corporations in the hospitality industry. Most recently, he served as president and chief executive officer of Strategic Hotels and Resorts, a company he founded nearly 20 years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Lawrence Geller. <laughs> gentlemen, you're on. Thank you, Jay. Uh, to share a stage with Lou is kind of ridiculous um, because neither of us are being paid today and he normally only gets on the stage if he's paid. <laughs> but Lou and I would like to thank you all and the City Club above all for inviting us here and for coming on a lovely day, the first day we've had in a while, to listen to two quirky, short, old guys. He's One with a strange Lawrence, accent. Not me. And that's Lou. <laughs> we want to talk about this city. This is a great city. And we want to talk about it because we truly love the city. We're great believers in Chicago and are determined to help it thrive and prosper in any way we can. We freely admit that we do so as unabashed optimists and dreamers. Dreamers we are. Naive we are not. Our histories and our decades at constantly turning dreams into reality speaks for itself. However, as realists, we acknowledge that this city is facing the greatest, challenge, greatest challenges of our generation. Government historically had a leading role in creating civic assets and that made Chicago a tourism uh, destination, they invested significant government funds, think Millennium Park. Those days are over, at least for the foreseeable future. Now it's up to us all, up to us as the business community, to take the lead in driving our city to fulfill its truly enormous, enormous potential. Lou and I are unapologetically passionate about Chicago's tourism project prospects. Indeed, so would each and every one of you if you discovered an untapped seam of oil or gold in your own backyard. For deep, we deeply believe, indeed, we're sure that there's vast unmined, unmined growth ahead of us and the resultant prosperity is there for our taking if we want it. But if you as a business community understand this incredible latent potential, then take your own actions. We can create together the momentum that success always, 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 always demands. Let me be absolutely clear about one thing. Today, this is not about Lou and me. We have nothing to peddle. This is about you and about all of us as a business community. So why actually are we here? We simply want to share with you today the fruits of our very well-researched labors and show a few examples of what can and indeed should be done to ignite tourism and to allow it to leapfrog, leapfrog into the pantheon of great tourist cities which we surely deserve to occupy. The only things that can stop us are a lack of business community will and collective ambition. We define today's success 
as you continuing to think about not only the city's tourism opportunities, but what you all can do to be part of it, creating tomorrow's success and creating your own call to actions and hopefully finding a way of making your own money out of tourism. Chicago is a great world-class city that the majority of the world simply doesn't know about. We've always been a city of visionaries and big dreamers. We've been a city who our business leaders know no fear. Now we must only tell the world what we are. We must show the world that we're constantly evolving and we're bringing bold, exciting, authentic, innovative tourism concepts. And we can then demonstrate that something is always happening new and different in our city. We have to start a conversation about this city that's heard around the world. For if we are to succeed, the reality is simple. We have no choice. We have to change Chicago's approach to tourism from old guard to vanguard. And that's what you are, the vanguard. When we studied the world's top 50 tourist destinations, we found Chicago was not included. I hope you're embarrassed about that because we certainly were. However, when we really studied it further, we realized that the top 50 cities included Munich and Ayers Rock. And for you that don't know where Ayers Rock is, and there may be one person in the room that I know does, Marlene, it's actually 335 miles away from Alice Springs in the Northern Territories of Australia, and we rank behind that. <laughs> we were somewhat embarrassed. Let me tell you, we're more than embarrassed now, and I tell you this seriously, I'm bloody well ashamed. I'm ashamed of all of us. That strengthened our resolve to study ways out of this, what I call an awful situation, and the result, Lou and I invested four years of time, enthusiasm, energy and money in figuring, out, in figuring out what practically can we do to remedy this. And I will only tell you, four years of being laughed out of a lot of offices in Chicago was pretty, pretty damn sad. However, I seem to specialize in rejection, so I took it lightly. <laughs> Today, tourism accounts for approximately 10% of global GDP and 8% of US GDP. By 2026, it will account for 9.5% of GDP in this country. Today, in this country, there are 14 million jobs in tourism, approximately 10% of the population. Sadly, the government is a bigger employer than tourism. And by the way, I think it's got even more growth potential. <laughs> and you're going to pay. <laughs> tourism has a dramatic effect on jobs in Chicago. These jobs may not be as headline catching or as sexy job as high tech. How do I get sick of hearing that word? But there's nothing more important than tourism growth to our city's prosperity. It's real and it's immediate. Our mayor had set a goal when he came into office for 50 million visits and 35,000 new jobs, visitors, sorry, and 35,000 new jobs by 2020. When Lou and I started this adventure in 2012, we wanted to find ways of increasing that visitation number from 50 to 55 million. We knew that that's metric, although it's headline catching, is actually not the real metric. The real metric is about generating direct and indirect revenues and thus creating more and more jobs. So what did we do? We studied the most successful tourism cities in the world and then del delved down to figure out the most attractive concepts that were driving those tourism. We came up with some 50 of them. We then hired the Boston Consulting Group to study which concepts most increase visitors, then increase the length of stay of existing visitors, and thirdly, simply and importantly, increase tourism spend. 
We asked BCG then to say, if we implemented the most demand-generating concepts, how would we fare against our 55 million visitor goal? The results absolutely stunned us. Simply stated, we learned in 2012 that if we executed against those key demand generators, those ones we'd identified and studied, by 2020, tourism in Chicago could attract not 55 million visitors, but 76 million. It would create not 35,000 incremental jobs, but 135,000 incremental jobs. It would generate 26 billion more in visitor spending. We ain't the smartest guys in the room, but finally the light bulb went off, went on. You say, I told you, I don't know what on earth, <laughs> but I'm British. <laughs> we realize that if the city executed these plans, these plans alone, many of the city's economic woes would disappear. So what did we do? Well, our sheer passion sent us on a quest to bring in the very, very best professionals from around the world, world to work with us, some of whom are in this room today. Let me tell you, their breadth, their depth, their skills, their capabilities are amazing. And they left us in awe, not of them, but of the potential this city still had ahead of us. And we believe we could finally snatch greatness from the ever-beckoning jaws of mediocrity in which we tend to languish. One of those cornerstones we think about in building a great Chicago tourist experience is the improvement on quality life, on qual our quality of life. Today, tourism and residency attractions are all converging. The gap is narrowing. So what benefits tourists benefits all the citizens of this city and every one of our communities. Increasing tourism increases jobs, increases prosperity, and in the turn, in turn, what do you know, the government actually gets some money to pay for it. That in turn decreases funding issues, but it does every single time increase the quality of the community's life. And what does it else do? It attracts the brightest, the best, from around the world to come and live, work, play, and help grow in our city. So let me be clear, absolutely clear, this is not about enriching the lives and wallets of the one percenters. This is about all of us adopting a practical plan that benefits everybody in the community, everybody in every demographic sector of our city, from Midway to Evanston, from the lake to Oak Park, Oak Ridge, absolutely everywhere. It's not just a city centre job. We established a handful of criteria through every one of which every one of these ideas had to go. We had to be able to communicate to the world what this was, what we were, and why it makes the city better. It had to ignite, ignite us and something that would give the world something interesting to talk about and would stimulate grow. We needed to start not only thinking iconically, but creating iconically. Because it's all too easy, and I've done this around the world, all too easy to end up homogenizing attractions and thus homogenizing your city. And every idea had to be measurably measurable in creating jobs, revenues, and value to the city. The more time and money we invested, we saw all of these components integrating until we realized a strange thing, that the sum of the parts dramatically created a world-beating whole. And that's what we're about. We believed importantly, and I'm going to say this once, we believed importantly that we could do it all without attacking or draining the city's wallets and that we as a business community can all of us prosper as the industry that, the industry that most, fuels tourism, uh, most fuels this city's prosperity grows, and that's tourism. We thought, we thought about these words real hard. Bold, authentic, unique. These words resonate 
in everything we're trying to do. The London Eye is one of those examples, an iconic element that drives visitors to London. The London Eye was new and a unique experience for the city. When we look at Chicago and what we have to offer, one of our greatest major physical differentiators is our waterfront, our lake, and our river. When we think about the tourist experience in Chicago, we see the nexus of that experience at Michigan Avenue and the river. But we need to change that. We need to dramatically think about expanding tourism into our neighborhoods in all directions. We think about the river. The city's more than $100 million investment in the Riverwalk now allows residents and tourists to stroll along the river in a continuous journey from the lake to, to West Wacker. The city's investment is fantastic, but it's just a start at what could be the backbone for further development and a crowning jewel in the city's park system. We need to think about the intersection of the Riverwalk and Lake Michigan, the, thinking about the lake from Lake to Michigan Avenue as, a, as, a, as an area that's respected to the residents that surround it, and the area from West Wacker to Michigan is more active, engaging, and participatory. We aren't just talking about downtown. We need to expand the visitor's experience into the city, pushing tourism south and west. We need to think about how the river can play into more memorable experiences. Imagine boarding a tour boat at Navy Pier and floating down the river past Ping Tong Park on a program journey that ends at Cermak. From there, imagine exploring a creative industries district where artists live, work, and play. Now think about the development that would be spurred alongside that riverfront. At Cermak, you're just a half mile from Chinatown and another half mile from McCormick Place. We believe the Cermak Corridor offers enormous opportunity. We also studied lighting. Lighting can transform the way that visitors and our residents perceive our city. Our research indicates that any time we align lighting with something else, the interest and the value in that something else is dramatically increased and improved. Innovative lighting can add enormous opportunity from an economic perspective and artistic value. Not only can light make each touring day longer by several hours, but it gives us a new opportunity to encourage tourists to visit during our winter months when our warm weather attractions aren't available. Our goal is not to light Chicago like Shanghai or Paris, but to create lighting that is unique to Chicago and celebrates who we are and enhances what we are. We spoke to a number of architects. The On team speaks about the power of light and how it can connect us. We engage the Boston Consulting Group, as Lauren said, to test the impact on lighting and tourism. The results were simply astonishing. Lighting in itself attracts people, but lighting added to features attracts tourists like flies to a flame. Move over, Paris. Chicago is the city of light. We challenge them to think about iconic buildings, already a tourist attraction and to envision these icons talking to each other. What do they say? How do they speak? Technology and imagination can take these icons to a whole new level. So they focused on darkness, reminding us the power of light comes from the dark. And the difference between day and night blurs. With the selective use of light, we can create the power that engages our city. When we think about ways to use light to keep people engaged longer and give them a reason to visit Chicago in our off season when it gets dark earlier, we all win. The architectural firm of RTKL suggests we consi consider Daniel Burnham's emerald necklace, strategically lighting our parks and boulevards throughout our city, using light as an asset to enhance our parks to create opportunities that drive tourists from one park to another,
to increase the economic viability throughout the surrounding neighborhoods for the benefit of our residents as well as our tourists. Our parks are a cornerstone to placemaking, a place where the community can come together and engage, a place that celebrates the community. And the fact, if they are in fact that hub of engagement in the community, they become an authentic experience that the travelers will seek out. That interaction, that touch, that connection starts with a conversation that transforms that tourist into an evangelist for our city. SOM thought about Michigan Avenue, our wall of buildings, and saw it as a differentiator, viewing it in a way that no other city can exploit. And with Gensler, we viewed the river and bridges in light as a world-class attraction that in itself is fitting of Chicago, the city of light. Light beckons us to explore Lower Wacker, lit with a sense of excitement. And the Merchandise Mart, a historic structure that peaks, speaks to the city's past, inside transforming into a new Chicago, a tech-rich environment that can be communicated on the outside in a way that's engaging for tourists and residents alike. Our facades become our screens, our entertainment, and yet another medium for a conversation about Chicago heard round the world. Davis Brody Bond took the back wall of the Lyric Opera, added a performance barge and a spectator barge, and projected outside the grandeur enjoyed by Lyric patrons inside. What a great addition to a Millennium Park concerts that could be. They reimagined the power of light in our subways as it travels throughout our city. And they took light from the grand scale down to the human scale by creating an ecosystem that could support fireflies in an urban environment, allowing us to be touched by these tiny beacons. We took a look at an underutilized and largely unknown city asset, the Pedway. It's underutilized for good reason. <laughs> Have you ever tried to make your way through the Pedway? Do you know which direction to go? It's time to recognize the Pedway as an asset. When leveraged with art, light, and sound, the Pedway can become a must-see attraction for tourism. Add wayfinding and you have something truly magical. And if we're able to make an impact on the Pedway, we've added to the value of the real estate along its route. Have you ever tried to make your way from Millennium Park to the state's biggest tourist attraction, Navy Pier? If you made it, you most likely crossed our newest park, the Riverwalk. The need to connect these major assets was part of the inspiration for a project we call Skyline. We all know the red line, the blue line, the green line. The Skyline is an aerial gondola, but not your typical aerial gondola. Built from the ground up and designed to operate in most weather conditions, this custom system 
would soar above the river, linking Navy Pier, Millennium Park, and the Riverwalk. This iconic attraction is engineered with a light footprint and extremely energy efficient and transports 3,000 people per hour in an unprecedented view of the city. The system links Navy Pier, Millennium Park, and the Riverwalk for tourists and in the fringe hours serves as transportation. The route goes from the pier, flies 17 stories above the river, and comes down on the south side of the Riverwalk with a very light footprint as it follows the Riverwalk to Wolf Point. In the off season, during the school year, our intention is to give it away to our schools, to have school buses line up at Navy Pier as we transport 3,000 kids an hour on a 30 minute journey, allowing them to be touched by the city like never before. Aerial gondolas around the world are designed to transport riders in most weather conditions. Though it's true here as well, this is not your typical aerial gondola. The system is bespoke, designed for Chicago, and built from the ground up. Led by David Marks of Marks Barfield, the designer and developer of the London Eye, and Steve Davis of Davis Brody Bonds. The London Eye is quoted by tourists as their number one reason for visiting London, the most sought after ticket in the city. What was first meant to be only a temporary attraction is now an icon seen round the world symbolizing London. We see this as one of those icons for our city. Looking west down the river, you can see how seamlessly the system fits into Chicago's vistas with what some have described as a gossamer touch. Let me uh, be very clear about something. This is no pipe dream. After four years of study, working with some of the best experts anywhere in the world, and frankly millions of dollars of, in of expense, we know this is real very real and can be done. Let me give you some metrics. The system as it's planned today will cost about $250 million. But the most important metric is that not a dime of city money is needed or will be invested. Let me say that again. Not a dime, not a penny, nothing. To the contrary, the financial benefits generated to the city are truly significant. And I personally can't think of any single project on the drawing boards now or previously that gets anywhere close to this one for benefits to the city's coffers. Studies show us 1.4 million incremental visitors will come annually generated by this uh, attraction. They will create 8,400 direct and indirect jobs between taxes, rents to the city, incremental tourism, direct and indirect spends, Chicago is projected to receive annual average financial benefits of over $330 million annually. Yes, annually. Plus, of course, the value of the free PR that will be spread around the world. This is truly iconic. 
and the world wants iconic destinations. This is a no-brainer. We all know Chicago's a city of neighborhoods, but do our visitors know that? Research clearly shows today's tourists want to experience the authenticity of neighborhoods. Airbnb is making a business of it. We need to think about the neighborhoods and the journey to them, inviting and engaging. We looked at a 20-minute cab ride to see where it would take us and who we would touch. We compared that radius with other world-class cities, and it started to resonate. And one of those model cities that we bumped into time and time again was Singapore. Singapore doubles their revenues and triples their attendance in 10 years. That's the power of tourism. If we're successful in attracting international tourists, they can be 10 times more valuable than those coming from nearby. We need to reinvent our main streets in our neighborhoods, encouraging tourists and residents to share the city and blend into one thriving audience, driving revenues for the community and improving our own quality of life turning our retail into assets, celebrating our architecture, and sharing the, our incredible variety of cultures. Parks are a place where residents and visitors come together to share an authentic local experience. Millennium Park and Grant Park are huge attractions for both Chicagoans and travelers. But our neighborhood parks are another asset that's often overlooked. Parks are more than just green spaces. Parks can serve as a backbone for placemaking in the community. They're hubs where the neighborhood can assemble, play, connect, celebrate, and interact in a powerful way. If the community finds their parks valuable and engaging, so do the travelers, seeking to touch our residents and neighborhoods firsthand. When kinetic elements of wind, water, and light are combined with art, sculpture, structure, and recreation, they create a mighty force that enhances the parks for all. Like residents, like restaurants and theaters, thriving parks serve as an open invitation for tourists to get off the beaten path and enjoy Chicago like a local. Driving tourists into our neighborhoods, our neighborhood parks, can serve as an economic driver for the surrounding community. It's time to, re to, to revive Jane and Bernie Solins, the founder of Second City's idea of an international theater festival and expand it into our neighborhoods. Edinburgh is working to define, and I didn't mean to cut those applause off, that's really bad. <laughs> Edinburgh, not not used to it, <laughs> Edinburgh is working on defining their identity through theater. Well, I have to tell you that Chicago is now the third most important city in the world for theater, behind only New York and London. But as far as I'm concerned, we're number one. With the 250 theaters that make up the League of Chicago Theaters, there's more new work on the stages of Chicago than anywhere else in the world. Chicago is now referred to by some as the Silicon Valley for theater. There are more startup theaters in Chicago than anywhere else as well. But does the world know that? Every summer, Edinburgh, Edinburgh plays host to an international theater festival and fringe festival, doing tw selling $24 million in tickets. It's power. You can't get into Edinburgh in the month of August. The idea that started with Bernie and Jane Solins needs to be re-examined, where we invite the world to experience what our city has to offer and bring artists and works from around the world. Theater is interchangeable with culture as far as we're concerned, so don't get stuck on the concept of theater. But building on the organic growth of theaters in our city, we looked at four hubs that covers more than 50 stages in those locations. We need to plant a flag that defines who we are 
It's time to invite the world to Chicago to celebrate our culture. Expanding tourism south creates huge opportunities. The more ex experiences we offer, the longer the visitors want to stay, and the more they'll want to return. I would venture to say that a large portion of the Chicago population knows there's a Chinatown, but doesn't know where it's at or how to get there because of our own great wall, the Stevenson Expressway. The Stevenson serves as a physical and psychological barrier that divides the North from the South. One of the keys to successfully pushing South is to build a cap, a green belt space over a small section of the Stevenson. Looking at examples around the country shows it can work, like this example of the Olympic Sculpture Park in Seattle. Development of transportation doesn't move quickly. Highly complex engineering projects take decades to develop and construct, call for significant funds, and require right-of-ways and land acquisitions often. In the interim, we need to conceive of strategies that allow travelers to transit from the airport to the loop effortlessly. We need to develop a wayfinding system with common language that's easily understood by locals and tourists alike. Maps of the city, symbols, orientations that speak to all of us regardless of our journey. We need to imagine a train from the airport to the loop that offers express service with enhanced amenities at a premium price, similar to the experience travelers have in our VIP airport lounges today. We need to look no further than Heathrow Airport or Tokyo's Norita Express to know it can work and work well. The use of marketing materials, advertising, in-flight magazines and videos orients the travelers. We need consistent wayfinding. Our maps, our colors, our fonts, our signage, they sound like small items, but they're huge if the traveler doesn't understand them. They're irrelevant. We believe we can do a luxury experience. We believe there's an upgraded train experience. Yes, it can be done, and yes, it can pay for itself. The travel industry refers to the most sought after travelers as the digital elite. You turn them upside down, and three devices fall out of their pockets. <laughs> They're often referred to as urban explorers or experiential collectors. Their travel is all about stories, either creating a narrative that they can share with others or following a narrative that others have shared with them. They want to see the major well-known attractions, but they also want local, authentic experiences so they can explore like a native. They want to customize their activities and make them unique. Social media, and content sharing has dramatically and permanently changed the travel agency. That's why we created Vomond. Place, whether small, infinite, extraordinary, or sacred, beckons us to enter. Invites us to linger. A place can still surprise us. Allow us to wonder. Preserve a time. And want to be remembered. The place demands to be asked. What happened here? Every story has a place. 
explore yours. Vermont. Vermont is a free app to tell stories of place that just started here in Chicago. And it allows everyone in the city to engage. Just as you have a playlist for music, Vermont is a playlist for your place and stories. Chicagoans can invite others to follow in their footsteps, and our visitors can share their stories of Chicago with others. Institutions and individuals can share their stories through audio, video, images, and text. And in fact, we have vomonded this version, this, this vision of tourism for you. I believe there's cards on the table that each of you can use. Uh, and you should use those cards and you can download what you've heard tonight, a good chunk of what you've heard tonight, and things that we didn't have time to cover. And by the way, we hope you'll use the free platform to tell your stories. And if you're like Lawrence, who has trouble turning on his cell phone, <laughs> there's a, 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 a number of members of the Beman team here that can assist you. It's with gratitude that we take the team that we're working with on this adventure and thank them for their patience and tolerance of two crazy dreamers. Thank you, by the way, four years ago when we started this, Lou was six foot two <laughs> and I was 31. <laughs> We've shown you a mere glimpse into four years of intensely researched work, ups, downs, dramas screaming at each other. But it's really work on how we as a community can thrive, really thrive by mining our tourism assets. This is only a taste of what can be accomplished. Let me be sure that we, you understand, this is not just a series of individual neat ideas. I hope you can begin to understand this is a community of changing impacts, of integrated and holistic solutions that come together, they ever spread, they ever evolve, and they reach their tentacles into every corner of every neighborhood in our city. We hope this appetizer begins to demonstrate Chicago's incredible potential, the potential for profitable tourism and incredible growth if, if, if we collectively have the appetite let me tell you what I know about Chicago after 30 plus years. That we're Chicagoans, Chicagoans, and it's simply not in our DNA to accept mediocrity. If we want to grasp greatness, it's here for the taking. It's ours. If you don't, then let me promise you one thing. Our competitor cities will push us further and further down in the rankings of global competitiveness while mediocrity once again enticingly beckons us forward. Tourism is highly competitive. It's incredibly fast changing. It's ever evolving and it is one of the most dynamic industries in the world. New and authentic experiences are today's siren song to the tourist and they're faced with ever growing options everywhere in the world. So if we're to succeed, we've got to constantly deliver new experiences to entice the tourist who's never been here and to bring those who have been back to our always growing, changing and ever evolving city. Don't forget one thing, technology is constantly changing tourism and consumption habits change along with it. So we have no choice but to change and change often or we will fall backwards. Standing still is simply not an option. Relying on government is not an option. Relying on others to do the work is not an option. Sitting on the sidelines is not an option. Because if you do all that, nothing will happen. Welcome to mediocrity. This is about what all of us can and should be doing. It's about all of us taking advantage of the untapped opportunity between, beneath our feet. It's there and it's just waiting for us. As we said right at the beginning of this presentation, this is not about Lou and me. We're only the mad messengers. 
We're just showing you a glimpse of what could be, and above all, delivering you a call to action. We're delivering our business community a call to action, because we want you to think about this, about what you can and should be doing, not only to better our city through tourism, but to take advantage of it, advantage of it for your own benefits. There's a quote that I've probably abused and misused many times over the years. It's attributed to both Ronald Reagan and Bobby Kennedy, which I think is perhaps appropriate for all of us in today's business community when thinking about this subject. If not us, who? If not now, when? Thank you. Do we have any questions? Why don't you get them up here? Lou, I'm going to let you do the questions. Uh, one question here is from Rick. Who is Rick? Okay, Rick Simon. So we're going to, you can start up. Any other questions? Why don't you just get them up to Lou? You want to read the questions? Yeah. <laughs> oh, great. Really, apropos whoever did this one, Rick. Given the departure of Don Welsh and today's report of five senior executives leaving Chu Chicago, what's the plan? I'm telling you to get out of here quickly. <laughs> let, let, me, let me answer that. The, the reality is this. Chu Chicago, which we sit on the executive committee, of, uh, uh, is, their entire focus is marketing. They're in a transition and we're convinced we're headed to bigger and better things. Don was wonderful but we're just as convinced what comes following Don will be as wonderful. Uh, Denise, uh, Tracy, McGowan, Tracy. You know, you can skip certain questions if you want. <laughs> Lou, how come Lawrence Geller is so handsome? <laughs> is it Botox? <laughs> Lou, uh, Spectacular presentation, sum it up. What's next? How do we take it forward? The reality is that what we need is the wind in the sail. You know, what's the priority? What ranks most important? What do we do first? It really all depends on you. This is an organic groundswell that's ultimately going to tell us and dictate to everyone in the room what we do first and where we go. So time will tell. Okay, Rodrigo. No public funding for the Chicago skyline. Who funds it and when do we start building it? How long will it take to complete? Okay, I'll take a little piece of that. Who funds it? It's a smashing, smashingly profitable deal and this will be funded by a mixture of bank debt, corporate bonds and private equity. And we know it's there. Who? It's how long does it take to complete? The, you know, one of the pieces on the how long question is the red tape. There's a number of hurdles that we have to jump. We believe and we've invested a lot of money testing those, those hurdles. Uh, once we have a green light, it's about 18 months to construct. We believe there's probably three or four years between now and then. Okay, we've seen a rise, uh, Ashvin, we've seen a rise in niche segments of tourism, uh, AG tourism, uh, culinary tourism, and now tech tourism. What other niche segments are ripe for Chicago? Okay, food, entertainment, sporting events, festivals. Medical. Medical tour, you name it, we can do it. But don't think that, that, that Choose Chicago is sitting on their hands waiting for that list. There's a focus underway. You know, what we're doing and what you saw here are items that, this is not Choose's job. Choose's job is to market the city and to drive visitors in. This helps. Okay, there's actually, if we've got time for two questions perhaps? Two. Okay, top tourist cities, Paris, Tokyo, etc., user-friendly with excellent signage, directional information, etc. Is there a group, a committee, a department now looking at upgrading such things here? There's a number of groups. It, 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 you know, the reality, reality is, we're rogue. We're nobody. 
So we can do the wild and crazy things that you see here. And part of what we've talked about and worked on with a number of people from the airport down to the pedway is wayfinding. Wayfinding, as simple as you might think it is, is highly complex, but it's critically important. So you go into the L and you know how to read a map. You know what side's up and what that map means. You don't have to decipher it every time you see a new communications device. That's what wayfinding's all about. Let me, ask, let me tell you something. Every idea you saw up here, every single idea, and probably I apologize because we didn't do a good job explaining it, comes from the research. Every action is a reaction to, to theoretical numbers that we went out and take them. Vamond started as wayfinding. It started as a reaction to wayfinding. Believe me, it still is. It's a brilliant execution, and, and Anijo, our lunatic partner, yeah, thank God for him. But it started as a, as a response. We didn't seek to do the skyline. We didn't seek any of this stuff. But nobody else is doing it. And we want it. The city benefits. We're both in tourism one way or another. Everybody benefits. We do. The bottom line is the entire presentation is about raising the tide. It's raising the tide for everybody. It's raising the tide for all of you. And ultimately, it's raising the tide for the people that live here. And quality of life has to be considered in everything we do. OK, the last question uh, Lou, from Perry Irma. What is the short, mid, and long-term plan for connecting South Lakefront and Southside cultural museum, et cetera, and tourist attractions? I can't say we have the answer to everything. Uh, that's one item we haven't studied, but it's critically important. Our museums need our support. We need to drive people into those museums. We need more of them. And we need transportation. We need wayfinding all to tie it together. Let me wrap it up and just say, what you see on here is what we're talking about. It isn't a series of ideas. That's only one. That's a whole, not, in, not components. That's what we can be and should be. So just don't go away, see there are a couple of lunatics with some crazy ideas. Our idea is the city as an integrated whole. It's what we've been trying to do, articulately, inarticulately, eptly, ineptly. But it's about the whole, not one idea. As I told you, we're pitching nothing. Nothing but your involvement. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Give them a round of applause. Uh, Mr. Geller, we have lunatics here all the time. Let's come up here. Give them a round of applause.